Hello, I'm Martin Wyatt. While the actions of professional athletes and teams are a hot button topic for the general public, we rarely have the opportunity to slow things down and take a serious in-depth look at this issue from the other side, talking with the athletes and team executives themselves. Well, here's Dan Ashley with four very special guests to do just that. Martin, thanks very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Ashley. So glad you're with us today. Some people say that sports in America is really a quasi-religion, with our ballparks, stadiums, and arenas acting as secular houses of worship in some respects. In our homes, you can get sports 24-7 on television, radio, and certainly the Internet. This has brought professional teams and their athletes unprecedented exposure and money. Sometimes for the better, of course, but sometimes not. This media and financial windfall has been called into question more times, than off, more times lately than ever before. Issues regarding the roles and responsibilities of professional athletes in our society, teams and leagues, to their communities, and to the nation as a whole. And we have a very distinguished group to talk about this, here to speak about the role and responsibilities of athletes and sports in this country are four people who have dealt with this issue very uh, extensively in their careers, in their own respective ways. And let me introduce them to you. Al Adels has been a player, head coach, and executive with the Golden State Warriors ever since the team moved to the West Coast in the early 1960s. Jennifer Azey is a two-year All-American and NCAA national champion with the Stanford University basketball team. She is an Olympic uh, gold medalist in basketball and enjoyed a 13-year professional basketball career, including five years in the WNBA. Roy Eisenhardt is an attorney, one of the hosts of the celebrated City Arts and Lectures series in San Francisco, and during the 1980s served as the president of the Oakland Athletics baseball team. Gwen Knapp is a graduate of Harvard University and a leading sports columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. Thank you all for being here today. Nice to have you to discuss uh, some of these issues today. And I'm going to start, uh, maybe Al, I'll start with you. Uh, tell me about the role of the professional athlete in America today. Well, I think it's changed over the years. I, you know, as a youngster growing up in New Jersey, we didn't have, obviously, the exposure to media that we have now. And so you kind of latched on to you know, the players, that, the Brooklyn Dodgers. I was a big Brooklyn Dodger fan, but I was more a Jackie Robinson fan sure. when he came in. Of course, later on, I met Willie and a couple of other people. And I, I think, unfortunately, many of the players today don't think that there's a responsibility, but I've always said once you sign that contract, your life as an athlete changes because of the people who come to see you play, and particularly young people. They idolize you, so consequently, you do have a larger responsibility than some of the people who say, you know, I'm just a player. I don't want anybody to really, you know, hold me into the esteem that they hold me in as an athlete. You know, and I've heard a lot of players, as you have over the years, tell us that in the media, that, hey, you know, my job is to mm -hmm. produce on the ball field. And I've always been a little, uh, that's always struck me as unfortunate because maybe they just don't get the mm -hmm. fact that they really do have a place in, in, in our society and young people really do look up to them. And Jennifer, you know this firsthand, particularly I would imagine in, in uh, women's basketball, you had lots of young girls aspiring to be you. Don't you think that, that, that uh, creates a, necess a necessity for you to have some responsibility to them? Definitely. And, you know, I love Charles Barkley, but um, I, I, you know, when he made the comment about yeah. athletes not being role models, I really disagree because I think that his comment was taken a little bit out of context, but I do believe that we're role models. And our sports are just a platform for hopefully helping kids become positive adults and to really do something that they believe in and that they're passionate about. And so I, I've always taken ownership of that role, and I think it's one of the greatest gifts that you can have as an athlete. I never fully understood why you wouldn't want to be a role model if you're given that privilege. Well, well I think, uh, to go back to what Jennifer said, I, I know what Charles was saying. I think it just came out wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was saying that the role model should be your family, it should yes. be your mother and your father. And I think he said it in the context that, that it was taken out of. And I, I, I don't think he understood what the question was. Okay. I think the question is, you know, when, and I've always said, once you sign that contract, then you do become a role model regardless of whether you want to be a role model or not. And the youngsters look up to you and you have to take that responsibility on, I think. Well, I think you're right. Charles Barkley was kind of referring to the need for us to focus on teachers and our parents and other real-life role models. But the reality is 
as an athlete, exactly. that wasn't his role model, probably. He picked somebody <laughs> in professional sports that he wanted to emulate growing up. I mean, that's sort of a natural thing to do. Roy, let me ask you, uh, you've been involved with the A's over the years. How has, has, not just baseball, you can talk specifically about baseball, of course, but how has sports as an entity changed? Obviously, the amount of money and exposure is so much greater than it was yeah. just a few decades ago. And the number of sports has changed. I mean, it used to just be basketball, football, and baseball with hockey there if you lived in the East. Now, the number of sports you can watch on television is mind-boggling. But how, uh, how has it changed? I think one of the biggest changes I see is it's gone from a live event to a television event with all of the ramifications of that. Because um, there's a lot less social commitment when you're watching a sport on television. You're just kind of looking for the outcome. If a commercial comes on, you flip to something else and you come back again. When you go to the event live, you, have a, you usually go with other people. There's a social quality to it. There's an investment of your time and your mental approach to the game. And that was, that's an inevitable consequence of the fact that there's so much more revenue available from the broader distribution through television and radio than there was ever in selling a, a live event. I think that then that amount of revenue starts to change the nature of the way people look at the sport, look at athletes, the kind of conversation you're having about what responsibility they have to give back. So I think that's the big change I see is the fact that we are now programming rather than a live event. And, and sports really is purely entertainment. It's television entertainment. Yeah. And, and, and nowhere do you see that more clearly, I think, than you see a lot of baseball games, particularly maybe other sports as well. But, but baseball comes to mind. Well, it used to be. But stands are empty when you see it on television. There's nobody in the. There's nobody in the yeah. in the ballpark. Yeah. But it's being televised, yeah. so they're making money, obviously. But it's awfully sad when I see, you know, a smattering mm -hmm. of uh, fans uh, in the stands. It's well, not it really a community event anymore. It used to be you only televised your road games. Right. And uh, not all of those. But now, with tech, satellites and everything, everything gets televised. Has, has money corrupted it? Uh, or or it, it's, it's added a lot to it. It's made yeah. it better in so many respects, but there are some negatives as a result. Well, it's like everything else. It's, had its, uh, it's improved the game in a lot of ways. You know it better. People understand it better. It's more accessible. I mean, I think about the people who can't go to a live game, they get to watch it on television, it fills a huge need. On the other hand, money can have uh, effects that not always are very attractive. And, uh, and it's expensive. We can talk about this is not really germane oh. to what we're talking about today, but it's expensive to take your kids yeah. to a ball game now. You're going to drop a lot of money, and that didn't used to be the case. I don't know how people afford to go. No, it's quite expensive. Uh, Gwen, let me ask you, as a columnist, mm -hmm. a sports columnist, you, you deal with athletes and sports teams all the time. Uh, what is your sense of where we are in this space right now? Well, I think there is a competing, there's a competing uh, force with the entertainment industry that you really already talked about. One of the things I hear people, not athletes per se, some athletes will argue it. Jose Canseco used to argue, we're entertainers now. And I would argue, and I think a lot of athletes would too, that you're not entertainers because entertainers, strictly speaking, the script is already done. Everybody knows what the outcome is when they shoot it. You don't want that in a sports event. That's what sets it apart. Baseball, if the outcome is already decided in advance, it's not that interesting. Um, nobody wants to watch a sports event when they already know the ending. And I think a lot of athletes get that. They get that what they do is special because they decide the outcome, not somebody who wrote a script. You know, you're an athlete. It's okay to be an entertaining athlete, but at the bottom line, you're a competitor. Right, exactly. Not just an entertainer. But, you know, when you watch any sporting event of any consequence now, even college football games, the spectacular, the show that they put on, just the player introductions is, mm -hmm. is a major event mm -hmm. now. I mean, the, the entertainment quality, the spectacle that we watch now is so much different. It's all the stuff around the competition that's much mm -hmm. bigger than it used to be. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it clearly is, Different. to some degree, a show. Yeah. Um, we're not going backward, I would suspect, Al or Jennifer. Athletes continue to occupy a more and more prominent role in our lives. They're on mm -hmm. covers of magazines, and they've transcended sports, many of them. Mm -hmm. They're not just sports figures now. They're celebrities in their own right. Does that... Uh, put upon them even more responsibility? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That We, we well, don't even hold them up now as just athletes. They're, they're more important to us than just athletes. Uh, I think it does, and contrary to popular belief, there are a number of athletes 
who embrace that. Unfortunately, the few who doesn't embrace it are the ones we hear a lot about. But, but I know a number of athletes over the years have done an outstanding job of trying to communicate to the young people the need for them to understand the job, to understand the opportunity, to understand the chance that they might not get there, and they try to communicate that. Unfortunately, many of the young people don't, so you have to continue to, to hit them. And obviously, you don't want to really hit them in the head physically, but you have to keep drumming it in so they understand that there is a possibility that I might not ever play. So I have to do other things, and I think that a number of the current athletes try to get that message across, particularly with the teams. And not only possibility, Al, uh, likelihood that you may never make it. It's well, tough to make it, isn't well, it? Well, we used to have a, a statistic that we used to talk about, and like one half of one percent of all people who play professional basketball, or who play basketball, get a chance to play professional basketball. One half of one half of one percent. Wow. So that means ninety-nine and a half percent of the people who play don't get a chance. The problem is. All the youngsters think that they will be in the half percentile sure. instead of the other one, and that's unfortunate. That's what we have to keep drumming mm -hmm. into the young people's heads. I used to think I was going to play PGA golf. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't break 80, but I thought, you know, one day it's going to happen. I know I'll be. Um, you know, teams now, uh, and I want to go back to something you said, because I think you're right. With, with the steroid investigation, with uh, the Michael Vick situation, all of these things that make the news, I would suspect the vast majority of professional athletes do act fairly responsibly and do give back mm -hmm. to the community. Sometimes those stories don't get told, um, obviously, and, and you know sometimes the, the, the headlines are the negative, unfortunately, exactly. at times. Um, but do you think do you think that these these young people are are trying to emulate this bad behavior? I mean, is there is there you know one of the things that 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 you see a lot of touchdown celebrations and a lot of over-the-top sort of mm -hmm. less sportsmanlike conduct now than you used to. And now if you go to high school football games, you see that too. You know, high school basketball games, you see that kind of behavior as well. Comment I, on any of I that? I think I, mean, I always We're behaving back, like these athletes. But I always go back to something my mother said years ago, and she's not here any longer, but it still sticks with me. She said, regardless of what people tell you or don't tell you, we all know the difference between right and wrong. And it doesn't, age doesn't have a factor in this. Young people know what's right or wrong, but when they do see other people doing things that they know are wrong, they may emulate them. And that's what we have to try to correct and try to get them to understand this is not the way to act. And you have to keep talking about it because if you stop one time, it's just like when you play basketball. You have to keep drumming in the fundamentals every single right. day. And a lot of players think, well, I, under I can do this. I don't really need to do that but they have to keep working on it because that's the only thing that makes them survive in the game. Who, who is responsible for this? Well, and I, I also think, just to go back to that, that I think if the media covered a little bit more of what's positive <coughs> about athletes, it would definitely be helpful because now in working with the NBA, so even working on the men's side, and I see a lot of these guys that do tremendous things with their foundations and they're giving back and they're doing a lot of really wonderful things but you don't really hear about that so what the kids see is what they see on television what they see in the media and that's not always the full picture right. of athletics and you know fortunately in women's sports we don't have quite the same i guess notoriety and the, the same issues per se i mean obviously now with marion jones that's a whole different sure. ball game but at the same time i don't think enough of the positive stories are out there but again, Marion Jones hasn't made headlines in a while until exactly. something bad right. happened. Mm -hmm. But I, I think those stories do get told sometimes, but usually within the context of the sporting event itself. When, mm -hmm. you become, when it gets outside the sporting event, it's the negative headlines mm -hmm. that, that tend to be mm -hmm. uh, focused on. Who, who is to blame here, if anybody is to blame? Are the leagues doing a poor job? The media doing a poor job? The athletes, the teams? Where are we falling out of line? Well, I, I think it's easy to, I'm going to go back a little, I think it's easy to overstate the problem. If you take any group, you're going to find people in there who don't play by the rules. Or are going to be the bad apples. I mean, there's always going to be some And true. so uh, the issue is, should we expect that percentage to be lower among professional athletes than we do among other professions, lawyers, TV announcers, whatever the, the case? Now, I could make the argument, in a lot of ways, we might expect that percentage to be higher because... Um, the psychological pressures that are, these people are under, the fact that failure is such a critical part of what they do. If you think of a baseball player, if they get a hit two times, two and a half times out of ten, they're successful. So they fail seven and a half times. Um, that's a difficult psychological framework 
to work in. And I think um, it's not surprising to me that when we get the, a few bad apples, the stories are pretty dramatic. And of course, it makes uh, for interesting reading and watching. And so I think, uh, we have to be careful about overstating the problem here. But nonetheless, who's responsible? I think more work could be done in this area by the various players associations that represent the individuals. They tend to focus more on the revenue side for the players, and I think less on the, the, the um, um, community. Yeah, community and the, and the protection of them from themselves in many cases. I'll put it that way. So I, I think the clubs can do a certain amount, but they get bound up in the problems around the negotiated contracts and the you know labor negotiations and everything like that. The business end of it. I mean, they're the focused business on the business. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I look to the players' associations and the agents to do more work here. But there's there's a business end of it for the players now too. I mean, the money at stake is significant. I mean, you can set up yourself and your family for generations. Where years ago it was a bit more love of the game. I mean, and not that they don't love the game now. Yeah. I'm sure that most do. But there is a business aspect for them, and it's serious business for them. Gwen, talk about the financial impact uh, uh, of, of what's happening in sports, not just for the teams, but for the players. Well, that becomes the incentive for people to promote themselves at the expense of team values, at the expense of um, sportsmanship. Um, it, the fact of the matter is, if you're an Olympic athlete or you're a football player who doesn't score that often and you get into the end zone or you win a gold medal and you don't celebrate in some sort of really exotic way, there's a really good chance you're going to get lost. And you can't I cut through the noise if you don't. And I think that's really unfortunate. That seems to be especially true in the United States. When you travel to other countries, you find that there's an appreciation for successful athletes that just because they're successful, people are intrigued by that in a way that I don't think Americans are. It's, it's really more of a cult of personality here. Yeah, you know, exactly. You know, I guess T.O. Uh, signing the... Yeah. T.O. was a very, very, very good football player. Oh, he's incredible. One when he was here in San Francisco, and he had an amazing catch at the end of the 1999 season in the playoffs. And yet he didn't become a big name until he celebrated on the Dallas Stars and got suspended for it. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, where do we go from here? What do we do about this? Uh, you know, uh, do we, how do we instill in our kids the right values to put that into context and perspective, the role of the athlete and your ambitions? As, as Al points out, one half of 1% are ever going to actually play professional sports in all likelihood. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with our kids to teach them to keep this in perspective? Anybody? Well, I, I think what you do is pretty much what you've done, Jennifer, as an athlete. The reason she became a good athlete or a great athlete is that she worked at it. There's an old saying that the only place that success comes before work is in the dictionary. So what happens is if you're going to be successful, you have to keep working at it. So you have to keep working with these young people to try to get them to understand. You keep drilling it into their heads that in order for them to become better people, they have to work at it. And you have to work at it, and, you have, and it's a, it's a never-ending job, but that's the only way you can do it. I have children, and I have to keep working with the children to get them to understand that if they're going to be successful, they have to work to be successful. And that's the only thing that I can say as far as how it happened, and maybe some people have some other ideas about it, but that's my opinion. Well, I heard another good line not long ago, the, the funny thing about luck, the harder I work, the luckier I, I get. You know, right. I've heard yeah. that many times before. Yeah. Um, Jennifer? Do you have children? I do not. You do not have children. Um, how do you, when you talk to children, mm -hmm. and you, and you, I, I know you do that all the time. I do that and a you, lot. You go to classrooms and, and right. meet with young people. What is it that you tell them about uh, your role? What is it you tell them about uh, athletics in general? What do you try to instill in them as they look down the road and, and figure out what they want to do? Because well, they're starry-eyed when they see you. You know that. Well, and, you know, first of all, to Al's point, I mean, he's obviously a fantastic parent because those are the values that I think we need to give kids. And when I go and speak to kids, I, don't, I hardly talk about basketball. I mean, I may tell them some of my experiences, and you know, they always want to know what was it like to win a gold medal. And, but if I show them the medal, I say, this isn't about, you know, winning this. It's not about the end result. It was about the process. And to Al's point also, it was about a lot of hard work. So whatever you want in life, it doesn't have to be sports. It can be anything. Sports are just a platform in order to help kids to become whatever they may become. And so it's really a joy for me to be able to talk to kids on that level. And I hope that parents will also continue 
to give them those messages because even now I know there's a lot of parents that put pressure on kids to get the scholarships. There's a lot of pressure on parents financially now. And so if their kids can perform to that level, then, you know, that's great. But um, I, I just think it's important that they have the, just the right values and they're going to be successful in whatever they choose. And there are a lot of gold medals in life that have nothing to do with athletics, obviously. Exactly. The mm -hmm. problem is, I think, for kids is they're not splattered all over Wheaties boxes and television, right. and so it doesn't seem like something necessarily to aspire to or to dream about, uh, and that can be a challenge. Well, and one thing that I think is hardly ever talked about is what happens after athletics. Mm -hmm. What happens when it's all over? What happens, you know, we're both retired athletes. Where do you go next? Because we show people when they're in their prime, but then what happens? And I think that's part of the story that's important to tell kids as well, that, hey, get your education. You know, be, be developing other skills aside from your sport, because at some point, that's it. That's a great it. point. I'm glad you brought that up, because the reality is, in athletics, it's over by the mm -hmm. time you're 35, most yep. of the time, if yep. you're lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and Al, you know, you mentioned this one half of 1% figure. I would imagine the, the percentage of professional athletes who made it, mm -hmm. who end up in careers like you have, is pretty small, too. Mm -hmm. well, well, because who gets to stay in sport after well, they leave. Well, I think what happened in many cases, I remember years ago, a number of ex-players didn't want to become coaches because, one, some of them knew how they <laughs> treated other coaches. <laughs> but the, the biggest problem was the amount of money that was being made. So they stayed away from it for that reason, and that's the wrong reason to get into it. But many of them think that they will be able to continue their life on that level after they finish playing. And I, I can tell you a number of horror stories where, you know, people didn't know them afterwards and, and they couldn't understand why and they didn't, you know, I remember talking to young people about trying to get their education when they were playing. And they didn't think it was important. And then when they finished playing, they were too embarrassed to go back to school and sure. they ended up doing some really strange things. And I can tell you some horror stories, which is not, this is not the place to tell them. Sure. But it's unfortunate a lot of things like that do happen. And I think the, the athletes, and that, that's why you have to teach young people to have that foundation, that yeah. background, mm -hmm. because the athletes that are really successful in life, right. Michael Jordan, afterward in business, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Chris Carter on HBO, mm -hmm. uh, Roger Stallback is a great example, mm -hmm. successful real estate. You know, people who have had something else to go back mm -hmm. to, but I would imagine, uh, Roy, most athletes, aren't preparing for the future. Um, well, if they can make, I mean, now now some of them don't have to as much because they can make so much money, and if they're smart with it, they can hang on to it. But yeah. Well, I know when I was 25, I probably wasn't preparing for the future. <laughs> either, but it's true. The, None of us were. Yeah, <laughs> but the, uh, that's where I, I come back to the support that the, both the family of the player and the agents can give them in sense of giving this perspective. Because there are the few people who do have lines of communication to the players. But I want to go back to your point about the kids because I think one of the uh, things that you, kids can learn from watching athletes is watching them when they lose, not when they win. It's yeah. easy to win. It's a great point. It's great. But uh, watch how they handle losing. Graciously, they accept it. You know, there's a lot of role model value in those kinds of situations. And so I think that's parents' responsibility. I think it's an, it, media can help with that, too. Sure. So and I think uh, losing and sportsmanship, yeah. you learn more from losing a lot of times than winning. You really do about yourself. And yeah. about your, um, you want to comment on that? Well, yeah. actually, I was going to say that, that I think that's something that the media should stress. And if you talk to sports writers, they'll tell you that the best stories are about the people who lose sometimes, mm -hmm. how they handle it, how much effort they gave. I watched the New York Giants play the Patriots in the last regular season game a couple of weeks ago. And I remember being struck by the fact that this was a great moment for the NFL because the Giants didn't have anything but really pride on the line. Right. And they played so hard mm -hmm. and so well. And I thought when they walked off, I said, the, the Patriots should be proud that they're undefeated, but the Giants should be proud because they showed that they love this game. They're not just playing for money. They're not just playing because there's something tangible on the line. And I, I thought that was wonderful. I don't think that that was stressed quite enough. Yeah, I, I was yeah. moving, actually. I it, was it was very moving. It really was. Yeah. Um, do, you, do you think, uh, to Chris, I mean, let me ask you this, Gwen, and, and then maybe I'll get uh, Jennifer and Al to weigh in on this as well. We, th we throw sometimes the professional athlete to the wolves now, it seems, in mm -hmm. that suddenly here's a kid who may or may not have had a great education coming through high school and college. Mm -hmm. Some do, but some don't. Suddenly they have all the money in the world and celebrity, and no one has really taught them or prepared them to handle that. 
And then we act surprised when they get in trouble mm -hmm. or they don't know what to do. Well, it depends. A, a lot of them are prepared because they were raised in good families. It's not just about education. You had a bunch of students on earlier talking about um, education being more than just trying to get good grades. I think that some of them aren't prepared to deal with being in the media spotlight and so they some of them show off or they don't show who they really are. They're either too shy or too They put a fake too much face your, on, right? Either way. Either way and they don't know how to just be themselves. And some of it is that they don't trust that that will be represented properly. But it is a very early age to be a public figure. I find that they're more sophisticated now. The younger younger athletes are much more sophisticated. A lot of it is they've already been online and created their own world with MySpace or Facebook and so they're used to sort of presenting themselves and to the world. And by sophisticated, do you mean uh, business savvy? No, I just, I just mean comfortable okay. with the situation, not awkward, and understanding all of the intricacies that are involved in being a media personality. And I find that they are better at it at a younger age than they used to be. Yeah. Jennifer, how hard was that for you to be famous and to be a successful athlete? Was that a big deal or was it something you were sort of prepared psychologically and emotionally to do? I think it just happened and it wasn't anything that was planned and it just sort of came with the territory and one of the greatest pleasures actually in that for me was seeing women's professional sports uh, happen during my playing years so it was all just very very exciting and so I think our group really took ownership of that and wanted to present more than just the minutes on the court. You know, we really wanted this thing to succeed. You were ambassador. We were, I remember you talked a lot about that at the time, how exciting it oh, was it to was, be part it of was it. Oh, it was just incredible. So I think some of that stuff didn't even, it, it, none, of, none of that mattered. And, you know, I think sports and entertainment are very similar in that, you know, you have a lot of now these young entertainers that get in the same kind of trouble, be it Britney Spears or any of these basically kids that get the notoriety when they're young, it's, it's a really hard thing to handle. And what happened to me, I was in my late 20s. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's a little bit of a different maturity level right. for, for that time. You know, now one of the things I always love watching uh, uh, old sports films, of all sports, it's always interesting to see hey, the Dan, history why, you, why do you keep looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it quite like that. What I was going to say, though, uh, it, it's always very impressive to, to, to watch athletes interviewed now from your generation. Mm -hmm. So many of them are doing very well, have mm -hmm. various professional lives that are very interesting, and, 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 and you still hear from them in, in, in uh, different walks of life now. And I wonder if that's going to be true of the athletes that we have today, the young athletes now. Uh, well, I, I think that when they're 60 years old, we're going to hear about what they're doing now. Well, unfortunately, there's going to be a number of them that you will have to hold some kind of benefit for because they will run through the money. Mm -hmm. and. And there's an old saying that maturity doesn't have an age, con you know, conversely to what people think. You know, you can be mature at an early age, just like you, or you can be mature at a later age. And what we have to do is we have to try to keep those young people getting to understand that in order for them to become mature, they have to, you know, work into the process themselves. You know, you can't go and do all the things. And I, I, I can talk about situations where people say, well, you know, I, I'm, my first five years, I'm going to, you know, do all the things I want to do. Then in my next five, I'm going to save my money. And they play one year. Right. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they have a problem. Then they go around and they go from place to place trying to find out how can I get on the right track. And I used to ask them, did you finish school? No. Uh, do you have a, you know, a job that you can, you know, an uh, entry-level job that you don't know? What are you going to do? Well, uh, maybe I can go and try out for another team. Well. The common denominator for all athletes is age. At some point, you're going to be too old to play. Then what do you do? So you have to try to get these young people understanding at an early age, and that's part of the responsibility that we try to have to do, the things that try to help these people. Okay, I'm going to wrap up very quickly here. With, let me just get one final comment briefly from each of you about uh, your sense of pride in or concern about where sports are, what role it plays in our society. What's good about it? What troubles you about it? Quinn, let me start with you. Put think, it into context, in other words. I still think that there's a lot of good in it. I think there are a lot of athletes behaving badly, and you talked about the negative headlines. But in some ways, the negative headlines can be perceived as a good thing because you have the athletes who are doing the wrong things, being singled out and being punished for it. And what you find is that a lot of the other athletes in the sports are saying, yes, go ahead and single this person out. Just don't assume that it's me because that person is aberrant. That person is different. But 
I think that the most important thing people can learn from sports, and this is something that we need to look for more, is how much most of these people love what they do and how deeply they're committed to it. And I think that when you look at that, that's something that can translate to any other area of life. The passion yes. and the commitment the to commitment. the excellence. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I was going to say very similar to what Gwen said, so I'll say something different, and that is that the uh, thing that worries me is how much the greater the sports gets, it's like the expanding universe, the more people seem to want to vent their anger at the sport team for losing. If you think about baseball, for example, if you win six out of ten games, you're probably going to win your division. Right. Yet, so that means those four losses are going to really upset a lot of people. And you get some disproportionate reaction, I think. And, uh, that worries me because I think is, if it's a function of the sport getting bigger and the sports are still getting bigger, then the anger is going to get bigger, and that worries me. You're talking about fans going out of control when you win or lose, yeah. and it's it, it just yeah. out of perspective. Everybody around the outer ring of the sports, you know, fans, media, uh, owners, yeah. everybody. Okay, yeah. interesting. Jennifer? I love sports. I, I've done it my whole life, and I feel like sports really bring us together, and I, you know, granted, I think there are some of those problems that are escalating, but fundamentally, sports really do bring people together. I mean, it, sports promotes school pride, community pride, and when done correctly, I mean, it, it is just one of the greatest things I think that we have in our country. And it promotes teamwork and Absolutely. focus and, and, and ambition and goals and everything else. Oh, yeah. I think we just have to continue to work with these young people as they grow, because if we nurture them, then they will nurture the group that comes behind them. And we have to get them to understand that in order to be successful, they have to work at it. And if they have to work at it and get it across to other people, those other people will work at it. So we just continue to nurture them. Okay. Thank you all. Thank we you. appreciate it. Terrific. Thanks Thank for being you. here. You Thank guys you. were great. Well, thanks to our panelists, Al Abels, Jennifer Azy, Roy Eisenhardt, and Gwen Knapp for your great insight today in candor. We appreciate it very much. They represent uh, professional athletes and sport in this society very well, and they know a great deal about it. We appreciate you guys being here. Thank you so much.